Hello, welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. Glad you could watch the program. Today we're talking about insufficient standards, and today we're going to talk about the idea of I feel it. You know, it's, it's really no secret that people uh, have been having a problem with authority that's been talked about for a generation, but you know, or more. But you know, some people, they pick insufficient standards of authority, and, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the one of I feel it. And you know, it really has to do with our impulses. You know, and, and there's definitely uh, marketing people out there that are <laughs> trying to captivate on that and trying to make it uh, something that they will make you buy their product. But you know, sometimes people, you know, I feel it, uh, it really it could be a very damaging kind of thing. I mean, it's not always damaging, but you know, it really depends on what their moral compass is. Some people's moral compass is so far off that I feel it may be something that they think is no big deal, but the people that have to suffer the consequences of it, that might be another matter. For example, you know, some people say, well, I just feel like doing this, whether other people feel like it or not. Well, think about where that could go, all the different things that could be involved in uh, that we can uh, harm people with. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about a passage in Galatians under this idea of I feel it, and is that a sufficient standard of authority or not. But I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the book of Galatians first. Show you this chart here that shows Old and New Testament books. I have the arrows pointing from the top to the bottom. You'll see that Galatians is a part of the New Testament. Also, you'll see that uh, it is a part of the epistles of Paul uh, to the churches of Galatia. It was one, among the early writings of the New Testament. Uh, of course, you know the New Testament books are laid out by uh, the type of literature. Uh, and also there's some chronology there, obviously, but uh, not everything is strictly chronological. And I think that chart does a real good job of pointing it out. Galatians is among the early books written of the New Testament. Some of the other early ones, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, and Romans, are some that Paul wrote uh, very early uh, after the church was established. It's a part of, you know, Paul went to Galatia. And one of the things to keep in mind, Galatia is not just a church. Uh, there's multiple churches because Galatia is not a town. It's a, it's a province. It's an area, it's sort of like a county. You know, Wadsworth, a city, is a part of Medina County. Well, Galatia would be sort of comparable to Medina County. And let me show you on the map. This is Paul's first missionary journey. You'll notice that he leaves and arrives uh, from Antioch, Assyria. And you'll notice that he goes right up, and you can see the all capital letters there, right in the middle of all that activity in uh, Turkey, or some places, you know, they call it uh, Asia Minor. But you'll notice right there, the words going uh, vertical there, Galatia. And Galatia includes multiple towns, as I said, like Pisidian of Antioch, uh, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, uh, and even southern Galatia. So, I mean, he's, he's in that area. It's his first missionary journey. He goes there, and he comes back to Antioch, and I think that's probably where he wrote to them. Probably went on this journey, met them all, established church, all that, got back to Antioch, Assyria, and wrote uh, to them. And this is the epistle of Galatians. And in that letter, he writes to them some things that they are to avoid. And let me just show you the passage. It's Galatians chapter 5. 16 through 21, and let me just read it uh, together. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, notice he uses that expression there, uh, so that you do not do the things that you wish. He's telling them, now, these are the things you should not be doing. Because, and what's, what's that mean? Well, you may feel like doing these things, but as a Christian, you should not do them. And these are them, and you should avoid them. 
So, you know, the idea that, you know, I feel like it's the right thing to do, or I feel like it's good for me, or I, f it, I feel it's going to make me happy, and the consequences can just do whatever. You know, that's something that, you know, we need to give serious thought about, because Christians are supposed to walk after the teachings of Jesus Christ, both in word and example, and also we follow the writings, the inspired writings of the New Testament, writings by his apostles and other uh, people empowered by the Holy Spirit, uh, to write what we are to do as Christians. Those are found in the New Testament. But you know, the passage I read is from the New King James, and the New King James does a pretty good job of updating some of the vocabulary from the King James. Uh, sometimes, you know, words, they change meaning, or maybe we're not so familiar with them. And so what I thought I would do is, I took the list of those uh, works of the flesh, as some people call them, and I put them in a series of tables. And I used a lexicon, it's called the, uh, the Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and Other Early Christian Literature. Boy, that's a mouthful. It's abbreviated as BDAG, BDAG. And it's one of the more reputable Greek lexicons out there. It's the latest edition of it. Uh, just came out just, just a few years ago. It's a big old book. I would have brought it in, but I had enough stuff to carry as it was. So I didn't bring it in to show it to you, but you can find it online pretty easy. It's about $150, $175. It's not cheap. But I spent some time and I looked up these words. And what I'm going to show you is a table that will have the English word from the New King James. <clears throat> and then it'll show you the Greek as it appears, as it was written, and also a transliteration of it, which is basically taking the Greek letters and giving them English letters. And then what I did was I give you the definition from that lexicon, which falls under the heading of BDAG. And what I thought we'd do is just go through these, and I'll just read to you the, the definition or the gloss or the synonyms, how, however they describe it. I didn't really go into that kind of detail. But let me just, I'll just read these definitions to you, and then ask yourself, do you understand what that word means? And then ask yourself, do I see other people doing this? And then ask yourself, Am I doing this? And why am I doing it? Am I doing it because I feel like I, I could do it? See, it's insufficient. The, the New Testament is telling you you should not do these things, even though you may feel like doing them. So that's a contradiction there, showing that trusting your feelings on the matter is not adequate. Well, let's take a look. Here's the first, um, first four words. Uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. And I have, like I said, there in the column, those are the Greek uh, words for those English words. And adultery is pretty straightforward. Adultery, same thing in the lexicon. Fornication, unlawful sexual intercourse, prostitution, unchastity, and fornication. Matter of fact, you look up that word uh, in other lexicons, they'll even give you more detail. And it includes things that, you know, such as uh, homosexuality, bestiality, and all kinds. This is really the umbrella term for any kind of sexual activity that falls out of what God has authorized. It's that word. And that's something that we should not be involved in as Christians. Then it has uncleanness. BDAG says a state of moral corruption, immorality, vileness, especially of sexual sins. And then lewdness, a lack of self-constraint, which involves one in conduct that violates all bounds of what is socially acceptable, self-abandonment. You know, society, society's changing. And, you know, so sometimes it's sort of hard to say, well, you know, our society is changing and it's accepting things that, you know, a generation or two ago would not have been socially acceptable. So you have to be careful of that kind of thing. But even then, there are things that people are doing that most decent, good people would say, you know what, that's just lewd. And we shouldn't be involved in that. Well, they may feel like doing that, but they shouldn't be involved in it. Well, let's take a look at the next four. Uh, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, and contentions. You know, idolatry, image worship, uh, walk in unlawful adultery, commit unlawful deeds connected with polytheistic worship. You know, the worship of these pagans was very immoral, had a lot of sexual immorality to it. But you know, the Bible depicts idolatry really as harlotry in God's eyes because you know, you're supposed to be faithful to God, but if you're worshiping idols, then that is the equivalent of, you know, a spouse cheating on her husband. That's, you know, that's sexual immorality. That's the way God looks at it. That's the way it's depicted. And then you have the term sorcery, uh, sorcery or magic, uh, hatred, enmity, and then contentions, 
engagement in rivalry, especially with reference to positions taken in a matter, strife, discord, and contentions. You know, how, how many of those do you think? And you might think adultery. We don't really have that, but you'd be mistaken. You, you would be very much mistaken if you don't think in the United States of America we don't have idolatry. The New Testament depicts covetousness as idolatry in the book of Colossians. That's one example. But it would surprise you probably the things you might even have them or see them, uh, things in our land that other people used to worship. And it might shock you uh, to see and learn about those kinds of things. So, you know, just because you have the object, I understand you might say, well, just because I have this object doesn't mean I'm worshiping that object. And, you know, I understand that. But at the same time, if you understand what it is, it's just that's something you really want to partake in and have. And it's something to be aware of and to be careful about. We you say, well, you know, I don't feel like any of these things are wrong. I mean, hatred, that's pretty bad. Attentions, that's not good either. But, you know, you might say, well, you know, that's not such a big deal. But, again, it's I feel like it versus what the New Testament says. New Testament says we're not to have anything to do with these things as Christians. Really, none of us are supposed to have anything to do with these things. Let's go look at the next one, the next four terms. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, and dissensions. Well, I could tell you right now, I see a lot of this. A lot of it. Intense negative feelings over another's achievements, success, jealousy, or envy. You know, someone asked me, you know, what's the difference between envy and jealousy? And we'll talk about that in a second. That's always an interesting question. But jealousy is intense negative feelings over another person's achievement or success, jealousy or envy, or outbursts of wrath. Um, matter of fact, I looked at another source, um, W.E. Vine's commentary on Galatians, and I like the way he puts this one. He says, jealousy smolders in the heart until it breaks out in wrath. It, you know, it's, it's a state of intense displeasure, but it's growing, and eventually you just can't contain it anymore. You ever have somebody say, you know what, I, I just couldn't stand it anymore. I, I just couldn't take it. It's just been building and building and building, and then I just finally let it out. Okay, well, what are you letting out? Are you letting out, well, you know, I, I was so excited, and I was so happy, and I was so joyous, and I wanted to share this good news with people. Oh, that's good, but that's not wrath. No, we're talking about, you know, people's like, I, I get so angry, and I hold it in, I hold it in, and you know what, and then this is what happens. Well, I just had to let it out. I felt like I was going to burst. Well, Outbursts of wrath is on the list. Selfish ambitions uh, is another one there, and also dissensions, a state of being in uh, factitious opposition or dissension. Uh, Vine wrote about this when he said, literally standing apart in which party-making and side-taking are bound to result. Not only is the believer to beware of causing divisions himself, he is to be on his guard against those who manifest this disposition. So, you might think, well, I'm not out there causing any trouble, but I see it all the time. And, you know, and all these things are going on. And, you know, and, hey, I, you know, my friend, he's just causing all this trouble. And, yeah, yeah, I sort of go with it. But I don't necessarily agree with everything he says and everything. Well, you need to be careful of that kind of situation and to be aware of it. Well, the next chart is the last of them, and it has five of them. And here they are, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and revelries. Well, I'm sure we're no stranger to those. Heresies, the idea that uh, maybe they teach something that's not exactly orthodox. And they hold some kind of view that sets them apart. And most people are like, you know what, that's just not right. I mean, you might use the term, um, of course, it depends, you know, what context you're talking about. But you might say, well, that's a cultic group. But, you know, it doesn't even have to be that. It could be something that, you know, it's just disruptive. Uh, it's a, you know, this group is just causing uh, dissension. And they're basically, you know, causing trouble. Uh, envy, envy and jealousy. Uh, Vine, and this is the part, you know, I thought was interesting. He has a good take on the difference between envy and jealousy. He says, envy differs from jealousy in that the former, envy, desires merely to deprive another of what he has, whereas the latter, jealousy, desires as well to have the same, or a similar thing for itself. So, you know, you, you, know, you, you ever, I mean, there's a fine line, but there's a big difference in those concepts. 
But, you know, if you ever saw somebody, you know, maybe you had that expression, you know, keep up with the Joneses. Maybe the Joneses got a new car. And you know what? You're like, you know, I'd, re I'd really like, to, I'd, I would like to have a new car. I really, you know, okay, well, you'd like to have a new car. All right, but, you know, those Joneses, you know, they got another new car. And, and I, you know, I, I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. You know, they're just making my life miserable and everything. But I'm trying, you know, that, that's jealousy. Or maybe you do this. Something like this. Well, you know, those Joneses, they got that new car, and they really shouldn't have that car. They, they really shouldn't have it. I don't want it, but they shouldn't have it either. Well, that, you're getting into envy. And they're both malicious. They really are. And we see it in our world all the time. Jealousy and envy. Jealous, wanting what someone else has for yourself. Envy, wishing they didn't have it, whether you want it or not. It might be a good way to paraphrase it. And then murders. Well, we understand murder and killing. Uh, drunkenness, uh, excessive indulgence in strong drink, as Vine has it in his commentary. And then revelries. Uh, excessive feasting, the consequence and concomitant of drunkenness. Well, some people might say, well, you know, oh, describe excessive. What's excessive mean? You know, it's always interesting when you talk to people about that, about, you know, social drinking. Oh, you know, I only had, you know, so much, you know, alcohol. You know, I don't drink to excess. Yeah, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, well, what does that mean? You know, so the idea of excess is like, it's sort of difficult to tell. But you know what? If you're debating with yourself, you know, I don't know if that's excessive or not. Chances are, if you're debating with yourself, it probably is. It, you probably already have gone into it, especially if you like it. I feel it. Well, you know, drunkenness, you know, we're supposed to stay away from uh, drugs and alcohol. Revelries are these like late night drinking parties and banqueting stuff. And, you know, we have that all over the place uh, in our country. But, you know, what? going back uh, to this passage again, we'll show it to you here in Galatians 5, 16 through 21. And this is a painting of uh, what somebody thinks the Apostle Paul may have looked like. Uh, we didn't have any photographs of them, but uh, I thought it'd be nice to look at something instead of a blank screen there. But I want you to notice the expression uh, there in that passage. It says, and the like, and the like, down there uh, around verse uh, 21, uh, right there, and the like. You know what that means? If it's anything like the items that we just talked about, even though it's not on the list per se, if it's like it, you shouldn't do it. Well, what's like jealousy, murder, envy, covetousness, drunkenness, dissension, hatred, idolatry? What's like those things? Well, there's all kinds of things. I mean, could you imagine if the New Testament had to document every single item that we were to do or not do. I mean, we, we have to be able to reason. God you know, gave us a mind. He gave us logic. He gave us these reasoning capacity. You know, we ought to be able to see that, you know what, if, if it's like this stuff, then we should stay away from it. So if our mind is telling us, well, I feel like doing it, but it's really a lot like that stuff. Well, maybe I should think about that some more before I go do it. Maybe I should give that some more thought. Uh, what other things fall under the category of similar to these? That's the way Vine defines that term. Things similar to these. You know, every once in a while, I'll have people say things like, well, you know what, we, you know, back in New Testament times, they didn't have cocaine. They didn't have heroin. They didn't have LSD. They didn't have all these kinds of drugs. I mean, they had drugs, but they had some pretty strong ones, and if you did a study of it, you might be surprised, the connection. But, you know, if, if he's condemning drunkenness, what do you think he feels about smoking marijuana? Now, you might say, well, David, you know what? Uh, I, you know, my doctor says that, I, you know, I could use marijuana, and it could help my condition, and he wrote me a prescription. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about using drugs for medicinal purposes. Not talking about it. 
Matter of fact, uh, if you go to a palliative care unit, they give some very strong narcotics to help ease people's pain if, as the end of their life comes. And those are drugs, and they're hard drugs. It, would I say it would be wrong for them to be given those drugs to help ease their pain? No, I'm not talking about being under a physician's care. What I'm talking about is self-medicating. I'm talking about self-medicating because you want to do it. I mean, think about how many people's lives have been ruined or, or maybe they're fighting for their life because of opiate drugs. Here in Wadsworth, you know, there's a, and it's, it's really across the United States, but at Wadsworth, I read the local paper and every, you know, every issue of the paper and they have TV programs here on the station, they talk about they're trying to raise awareness of the dangers of opiate drugs. That would be on the list. I know it doesn't say it, but that would be and the like. We need to stay away from it. You see, God, does, does he really tell us not to do things just because he doesn't want us to have fun? You know, sometimes people will criticize Christians that way. You know, if you Christians, you know, if you would just loosen up some and do some of this stuff, you would have fun. I don't think it's any fun to watch a father and a mother worry themselves sick whether their child is going to be able to weather rehab because of drugs. I, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's any fun at all. And I don't think it's any fun at all for the child or another person, you know, that have to be necessarily a parents and children I don't think they have any fun when they find out that these drugs have such a deep hook into them. That they would probably they would probably prefer to have a physical hook drug through their body and work that out instead of having to get rid of the hook that they have in, from drugs. The such like. You think they're having fun? Did God tell them, you know, not to do something to keep them from fun? Or did he tell them not to do things because it displeases him, but also it's just really not good for you. And God loves us and he wants us to have good things, good emotions, good possessions, good health. He wants those things for us. But, you know, people, they, you know, they want to do what they want to do. They want to do it because they feel like it. They feel it. That's insufficient. And I know you could probably, you know, you could say, you know, that David Kenny, you know, he doesn't know anything about that stuff, and you'd be wrong. But, you know, this isn't true confession. I'm just telling you, I know. I know what it's like to watch a friend who's strung out on drugs. I know these things. Stay away from those things, young people. Don't get involved in them. Some people never get out of it. Don't make that mistake. Incidentally, um, for you textual critics out there, you know, you might want to, you know, take a look and you might find out, oh, you know what, my translation, maybe you have the, I don't know, I didn't look closely, but, you know, sometimes the New American Standard, English Standard, some of these uh, different translations that are based on the critical text, sometimes, you know, they don't have the term adultery or murder in there. Does that mean it's okay to commit adultery and murder? No, such like, such like. Now, you might think, well, these are minor matters, but you know what? He also says, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's serious business. Well, what is a Christian supposed to do? Well, take a look at this passage. This is Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And notice these fruits of the Spirit. And I underline them for you. But what I want you to understand here, and I put the blue, that's right before it, that list there. You have to decide. Christians have decided to follow Christ. They have decided to follow his example and his teachings. And because of that, you have to decide to do these things. You can't just go by, I feel it. I feel it is an insufficient standard to govern your life. Thanks for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. 
or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Thank mm -hmm. you.